Well, we just got back from a really fun week at camp. Uh, how many of you had campers that went to camp with us this week? Show of hands. Okay, I see a few of your hands. Anyways, this week uh, at camp, we, we had some incredible times. Patricia Bootsma with, was with us as our nurse. She also spoke. We had David Slyker from IHOP uh, who came up for a few days. It was, it was a really great time, full of games, full of uh, some Holy Spirit encounters. And um, one of the highlights of our games, I think, of the week was cow tongue football, where it sounds just like it, it's called. It's football with a cow tongue. Um, but we have a few of the campers here who want to share a little bit about what God did. So let's start with Jonathan. Jonathan, what's your name? My name is Jonathan. <laughs> Excellent. And so Jonathan, you want to share about what God did for the first time at camp. Uh, it was uh, my first time that I actually really felt uh, the Lord. Uh, I, I remember I was just uh, being prayed for and uh, then a um, person who was praying for me gave me a word, and then right then I just started sobbing and just sobbing, and then uh, it, it was a good, like, few minutes. And then I just started laughing, and everyone else started laughing. <laughs> and then it was just an entire giggle fest. <laughs> That's awesome. So God moved in your heart for the first time in a, in a visible way. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, next we have James over here. James, tell us your name. My name is James. Everyone say hi, James. Hi. Great. My voice is a bit bad because I kind of lost it like two times. So, um, uh, well, camp was really fun. We did a lot of things. Yeah. Cowtown football, um, <laughs> grease pig. That was fun. Um, highlights were. Um, I feel like I'm really loud. It's okay. Okay, so. Um, we'll, we'll take care of the ball. Okay. Um, so we were like praying for people, right? And I was praying for this guy named Steven. I don't know, some, some of you might know him. And he just started to laugh, and, and I started to laugh. And I don't know why I was laughing, but I was just, just laughing. And I kept on laughing. My stomach was hurting really bad, and I just could, I didn't know why I was laughing. It was just really bad, and, and it like lasted the whole night, so yeah. That's awesome. So have you ever had an experience like that where you couldn't stop laughing? No, no, not really. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, James. Joseph, come on over. As Joseph is coming over, we had one young gal. She's not with us this morning, but she was under the power of the Holy Spirit, and we sent them all back to their cabins after chapel to go get ready, and one of her counselors found her in the middle of the pathway just sprawled out and manifesting. It was, it was a lot of fun. Joseph, tell us uh, about what God was doing. Uh, so this year at camp, God did a lot, but we're just going to keep it short today, right? Um, so um, uh, I went up for prayer for um, preaching the end times. It was like a, sort of an altar call thing. And um, I started just crying and, and weeping. And as people just surrounded me, I just started to go deeper. And then I got this uh, vision of... Uh, the youth on they own this really riggedy boat like in the middle of the ocean there was no land around and then all of a sudden I don't know this huge wave just rises up um, on the horizon where we can't even see anything else and then it overtakes us and then we're just underwater and I look around and it's and it's not the same ship at all it's like this golden huge ship equipped with cannons and everything and you know I didn't I didn't see this but I knew that, that Jesus was on top in the lookout area just pointing forward right and guiding us and um, yeah so I just and then I looked up as well and I still saw that old riggedy ship on top so I felt like that was the physical and underneath our spiritual boat was huge and strong so even though it looks riggedy into the physical we're actually really strong in the spiritual so that's incredible. Some of these testimonies um, we're going to be getting more in depth with. We're going to be filming and, and hopefully releasing a video um, to be able to share with you, church family, because some of the testimonies, we've asked them to shorten it to 30 seconds, which is not easy to always do. Right, Gabby? Yeah. Uh, camp was... Can I hold it? Okay. <laughs> camp, camp, was, camp was definitely like one of the best times of my life. At first, I didn't really feel like going, but I know that was not a God feeling. So uh, on Thursday night, I was just talking to my friend Matthias after worship. I'm like, oh, we never had an encounter. Oh, I never had an encounter with God, even though the amount of times I've been going to church my whole life. And then we went up to pray, like in a group, and then I just started shaking. 
And I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> my, like my, I couldn't control it, my hand was just shaking. And then my whole body ended up shaking. And then my head. And then eventually uh, I fell on the ground. And I was just shaking on the ground. And then Patricia started praying over me, saying like, repent and all these things. <laughs> and then... And then, in context for the altar call, it made sense. In in context, I'm like, why why am I hitting myself? Like, I thought I'm supposed to be filled up with the Holy Spirit, and I'm just hitting myself. And I was punching people around me. They were saying how hard I was hitting them. And then, uh, and then I felt like I need to throw up. And I'm like, why do I need to throw up if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? All right. And then, and then I'm like, what the heck? So, so, then, so then after I got some water and then I still needed to throw up, so then I went to the washroom with my friend and then I, I didn't feel like throwing up anymore. But then as I got to the toilet, he was just praying over me. And then eventually, eventually the feeling started to come back. And then what he said, he's like, demon, come out. Demon, come out. And then I felt like throwing up more and then I was like, <clears throat> and then... And then he's like, demon, come out. And then I threw up. I threw up everything. And it was the most incredible experience. Yeah. That's awesome. Great testimony. Again, much more in-depth we can share later. I'll swap with you, Jill. Thanks. So for our last testimony, we have Sophia. Hey, I'm Sophia. So Sophia was on my team at camp, so I got to get to know her really well. Um, and God did a lot of amazing stuff in her heart. So Sophia, um, how long ago did you stop going to church? Like, um, for like three years, I felt disconnected from God. And I just, like, hey, like hated going to church all the time. So I stopped going. And coming to camp was a last-minute decision, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, my parents <laughs> made me. Her parents made her come to camp. So when did things start happening at camp? Um, so it was Thursday night, um, a song came up, it was, uh, No Longer Slaves, and, like, the song, like, the lyric was, I am, I am a child of, I am a child of God, and when that song came up, I just, like, started crying, and, like, I felt the Holy Spirit hit me, and then Ben and Naomi came, and they started praying over me, and then Patricia Bootsma came, and she started, like, just, like, telling me to, like, repent and making me like <laughs> and like just I, and then like I just started pouring out and crying like all the pain I felt inside so I did that then I like I guess I went into soaking like just like for a long time and God God showed me a vision where I was like on top of a cliff and underneath was like a huge fountain like it was gold and it was like shooting out water and in there was like kids like drinking like drinking the water and they were like laughing with the holy spirit and they're just like like enjoying it and then i was at the top of the cliff and like we talked about fear this time like during camp and i was at the top and i was just like like so afraid to jump and take that jump in there and like god showed me that and uh, so I guess I'm taking the jump now. And uh... Amen. And Sophia, how do you feel now? How do you feel after camp? Um, I guess I feel more connected and just like I want to get back on track with God. Amen. So just to put it in context, that one big chapel session, the ministry time was about repentance and repenting from something that was holding us back from God. So it wasn't the only message of the week. But it was an incredible time. So thank you for your prayers and your support. And we look forward to being able to, to share a lot more with what God's doing in your youth. Thank you, Patricia, for saying repent several times. <laughs> I saw Patricia, and when, I don't know if you saw her reaction when they're saying those things, but, but she sort of knew it was coming, I think. Did you not? <laughs> very, very good. Well, it's like when, when God uses you to, uh, to speak, and you get insight into what's going on, like as soon as we agree with the Holy Spirit, then God's stuff happens, doesn't it? And sometimes that begins by humbling ourselves and saying, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? And repenting. It's one of the ways forwards is to, is to be repenting. Well, welcome everyone. My name's Steve Long. For those of you who don't know me, I'm not always here. Sandra and I 
uh, as the senior leaders of Catch the Fire, we get to travel to all the different campuses that we have, and so that's generally what happens. And every third month, Sandra and I are here for, for pretty well the whole month. And so September's that when, when we're going to be here. Uh, in two weeks, Sandra and I are going to Catch Fire Ottawa for their first anniversary. And so we won't be here that week, but I have the privilege all this month of speaking. And we're starting another series. And uh, so tech guys, if you don't mind putting up my, my PowerPoints, all year long, this is our theme of uh, being like Jesus, living like him. And our sermons are, are really on one of three themes. We're talking about the greatest commandment all this year and different aspects of it that Jesus said is to love God, love others as you love yourself. And so this series this month is all about the loving others. And I think this is the second or the third little series we've had, just how do we go about doing all that kind of stuff. And what I'm going to do in my talks, and I believe John Bootsma, who's going to be doing talk number three, is going to be doing the same, is we're going to have someone come up and tell a story of how they're actually doing what we're talking about. And so this morning, um, uh, in a few moments, John Jeffkins from our church is going to be uh, doing that. Next week, I have uh, one of our friends. He's part of Catch Fire Raleigh. He's a can uh, Canadian by birth, but lives in Raleigh now. And seven years ago, the Lord told him, while he was on a missions trip to Uganda, the Lord told him to make a story into a movie. And so he's going to be here next week. Troy Broder's his name. And he's going to be speaking Saturday night. Speaking? I don't know if that's the right word. He's going to be a featured person at the Toronto International Film Festival next week. And he has a Disney movie that he's the executive producer. So seven years ago, he knew nothing about movies other than you pay dollars to go. And now he's the executive producer of a Disney movie that has a Christian theme all the way through it. And so he's going to be sharing his story of how do you take a, a God thought and make it happen is what he's going to do. And then in a couple, in the fourth week, I'm going to have one of our former pastors come back. His name is Curtis Hines. He pastors now in Meadowvale in Mississauga. And Curtis is a part-time chaplain for the Peel police officers for Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon. And just talk about how God allowed him and opened the doors for him to be very involved in the community. And so what we're doing this, this month is looking at the whole idea that uh, we're allowed to and expected to take Jesus into the marketplace, onto our streets, into our communities, into our schools. Everywhere that we go, he goes with us. Yep. Did you know that? And so that's, that's what we're going to be looking at all this, um, all this month. And today we're going to talk a little bit about a passage in the scriptures from Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bible, you can open it to, to that passage. Otherwise, here it is on the screen. This is the story of Jesus. And it says, after this, the Lord Jesus appointed 72 others. And he sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Notice that it's his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. And so two quick things before John comes up to share. Number one, our mission, every one of us, our mission is our street, our town, our condo, our apartment, our house. So at the very end of the street, on the, that big tree right in the middle, just to the left, is my house. Well, not my house, the bank's house. Uh, we share it with Sandra, uh, my oldest son, John, and, and his wife, Melissa, that are sitting over there. But this is our street, 14 houses on our little cul-de-sac. We're right at the very end. And the scripture says that Jesus sent these 72 people ahead of him to whereabouts? Every town and every place. Guess what? That means you. You have a place, do you not? Some of you are going, I don't know what he's talking about. You, you have a house, you have a condo that you live in, you have an apartment. Every single one of us has a place, correct? So the principle here is that everywhere that Jesus wants to go, he's sending people, and look at the end of this little verse, it says, to every town and place where Jesus was about to go. I had never seen this verse before, or I'd seen the verse before. I'd read it lots and lots of times. But the implication that I saw right away was, if I don't do my part on my street ahead of Jesus, he's, he's waiting for me to go first and do my part. Then he comes behind me and he does his part. Uh-huh. I'd never seen that before. Well, I had, but I'd never seen it. 
And here it is, is his promises that when we go ahead, he comes after us. So last night, as I'm preparing, I'm thinking about my sermon. I'm working in my backyard. We're building a, a patio area. And so as I'm shoveling gravel, I'm looking down my street and I realize, uh, you know what, I haven't um, prayed on my street today. So I just went down this one side and came back, got to talk to three of my neighbors in like five minutes. And just walking up my street, coming back down, and people are happen to be outside, you just wave, you say hi, all those different kind of things. And one of my neighbors, in fact, we share a driveway, um, and he lives in the basement of this house, and um, he, parked his, he parks his car in his side of the driveway, and he has a really nice car, and he loves his car. He's one of those guys that his car is always clean. And he had told us that when we're going to be working on our backyard and taking gravel, which is dumped in our driveway, and wheel it in the wheelbarrow to the backyard, could we please let him know because he doesn't want to have gravel dust on his car? That's appropriate. So I went and knocked on his door and said, uh, we're moving the, moving the gravel today. And so he, he parked his car further down the driveway and uh, out of dust zone. And so we're doing all that. And then at the end of the night, 8 o'clock, 8.30 last night, uh, I went and knocked on his door again to uh, tell him he could move his car back to his normal parking spot. And we probably had 15 minutes of discussing. And guess what? He's interviewing me about Jesus. Uh, it was like, he goes, well, I haven't seen you around. So I've been traveling. Well, where have you been traveling? Well, what have you been doing? Why would you do that? And it's like, he's, I, it's amazing. When we go out, and remember, Jesus sent 72 people. We don't know their names, ordinary folks. As Jesus sent them out, they went ahead of Jesus. So the whole theory that I've been really feeling from the Holy Spirit is that as I do my part, as I pray on my street, if you're in a condo, just walking your halls. And just before you go in, uh, get back from work, whatever, just go down one end, come back the other. If it's appropriate, just put your hand on the, the door, around the door. Just pray a blessing. Speak God's presence. And then get ready for Jesus to show up behind you and begin to do this stuff. Yep. That's what we're going to be talking about all month. So, John, come on up, please. This is John Jeffkins. Give him a hand. <laughs> Yay. One, two, one, two, one, two. There we are. Perfect. So I'm going to interview John a little bit, and uh, he's going to sort of fill in some gaps. But John is a marketing specialist, and you've worked for a few charities in your life, haven't you? Two. Which ones? I worked for Heart and Stroke and the Arthritis Society. Actually, three in Plan Canada. Plan Canada. Yeah. Which used to be the foster parents plan. Correct. So you sort of had in your DNA, the God's put in you uh, the idea of helping charities do their job well. Correct. I call it corporate social responsibility. Fancy word. Corporate yeah. social responsibility. Yeah. So what does that mean when you go into a, a workplace? Just well, a lot a of bit. companies believe in corporate social responsibility. You'd be familiar with them, for instance, like CIBC Run for the Cure, Basel Ride for Heart, McDonald's, McDonald House. So a lot of companies put in their strategic plans. They want to give back into the community and into people. So that's always been a passion of mine, is corporate social responsibility. And I'm not working in the charity sector now. I'm in um, another organization for six years. And I've brought that into our organizations. I think it's important for companies to give back. So you're head of marketing for an electrical company? National Association for the Electrical Industry. So it's all the electricians, all the unions, that kind of stuff, it's all the more companies across Canada? Manufacturers and distributors, those that make lights and ballasts okay. and all that type all of that stuff. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so you, you, were, you had the idea that God gave you to go and to pitch to them that they needed to be more corporately responsible and needed to choose a charity, correct? Yes. We were working with one charity, and I just found it was a bit stale. So I believe that when God... One of my passions is corporate social responsibility. And I believe when God gives you creativity and ideas and pours favor on it, things happen. Yeah. So I actually, to your point, um, I ended the other program and I had the idea of starting this new one with this other organization. So the one that you suggested was a Christian organization. 
So how did that go over? Tell, tell people what the organization is and how that process go of well, presenting that to the bigger, it's, big shots. It's actually Habitat for Humanity. And what, ha what happened was I had heard of them, I'd never worked with them, and I had the idea, and I believe it was God inspired, they'd be a great fit for our organization. I knew they were doing work with some of our other members, so I approached my president and CEO and I said, I think they would be a wonderful fit. He got on side, we did our due diligence, and it took a few months. He and I had two presentations to our board of directors, and in the end of June, they officially approved it. So Habitat for Humanity builds houses for low-income people. Yes. And they need electrical stuff. Yes. So it's, 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 a, it's both a win-win because our members provide product, will be providing product to Habitat Humanity build sites, plus they'll also probably be giving cash as well. So and a, another association I did some research on, they, they've been working for a number of years and they're giving over a million dollars a year to them. Excellent. So friends, my point is, uh, where you are is where Jesus is as well. Everywhere we go, Jesus is there. And so the question that we're going to be provoking you with is how do you bring Jesus into your workplace? And so what John has done is one of your passions for a number of different years is to have corporations do charity and you matched it with a perfect charity that just happens to have a Christian angle to it as yeah, well. Yeah, it was a strategic alignment. Very, very good. Yeah. Can, do you mind telling people about how you got that job, the prophetic word that you had at the back? <clears throat> I think this is a great story. Yeah, well, what happened was about, I think it was 2009, um, I came in here and I, I woke up one morning and I said to my wife, I think I should go to the prophetic. I'd never been to the prophetic in my life. And I showed up here. They had it in the back room. And I went in there and I sat there and these people had sat around me and they started praying for me. And the word was, you're going through a transition. And I didn't know really what that meant. So I went in the next day to work and I got laid off. <laughs> so, but so, there was more than the transition. It was that was, God was going to open a door. Yeah, God was going to open another door. So I had been, um, I believe God gives you the desires of your heart. So I'd been praying for a role where I could get into corporate social responsibility aligned with an organization. So the Lord opened the door for me to go work at Heart and Stroke. And I worked their contract for about a year. And then after that, I was, while I was there, I was constantly networking on the CSR space, and I ended up getting the perfect job, which is actually five minutes from my house. It's just down the end of the road here in Atwell, and I'm having a blast there and doing all kinds of fun stuff. And God said favor, and you've had promotions and uh, yep. salary increases and yep. all that kind of stuff. Yep. So God's all over this. Yep. I was thinking, when I was sitting there this morning, you were speaking, I was thinking one of my favorite stories is Nehemiah where he goes and he wants to rebuild the wall and he goes to the king and the king gives him all kinds of favor to go out and do the task and that's what I find. So one more thing. Uh, John's uh, father came to Canada in a very unique way. Do you want to take two or three minutes to talk about that? Yeah, my dad was a British home child. He came here when he was six years old and the Lord's really taken this story and propelled it. Um, through, through, I believe, miracles, through God, I actually found his family in England last year. And so explain the British home child. British home children was put together by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Bernardo, and he actually took children from England and shipped them here and put them on farms. So my father, who's deceased, did not know who his parents were, had no relationship with the family, didn't know who they were. And I actually found them, and what actually happened was the Toronto Star did a feature story on it, and they, the headline was actually a century-old secret unraveled in 30 minutes, because that's what that was a real miracle. So as a result, I'm, I, I get asked to go speak at a lot of places to tell the story, and I'm able to share how my dad later in life became a Christian, and um, and it's a platform for me to share the gospel, but also share a pretty happy story. And you've um, now you're in a writers' club, and you're writing that story. Tell that. Yeah, I'm writing. Well, I'm trying to write a book, I just wrote something that's being published in the Mississauga Writers Anthology, which is coming out in two weeks. So this is pretty good. Yeah, it's all exciting. So when God's behind it, I believe he gives you, he works through your passions and he gives you abundant life, what he promises. Very, very the only good. thing I have to do is be available and vulnerable. Perfect. Alrighty, everyone who's at a senior management level in your company or up, stand up. So president, CEO, senior management, executives, stand up if that's you. 
If you're on your own business, that's you as well, because you're it. All righty, let's uh, just, if someone's near you, just put your hand on their shoulder, on their back. And uh, Father, we're, we're thanking you for John's story, thanking you that uh, he's got a great job doing the very things that he knew, knows he was called to, and uh, that uh, he's bringing Jesus into his workplace, he's bringing God's favor into the work, in his workplace, he's opening doors for the kingdom of God in his workplace. And Father, we bless everyone who's standing right now, and those of you that are watching on Catch Fire TV, Father, thank you for all these people, and may doors open, and may you find yourself like Nehemiah, right before a king, right before an, uh, a senior executive, um, CEOs, presidents, and may the God ideas that God's given you, may you be able to present them uh, intelligently, be able to present them with a strategy and a plan. May God give you the wherewithal, just like he did for Nehemiah, to be able to share his heart and may you be able to bring Jesus into your corporation, your, your company. May God bless you. And may he give you great creative ideas for how you can be a blessing. And uh, people get jobs, increase, all those different kind of things be happening because of you and your partnership with the Holy Spirit. So bless these people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Very, very good. So back to the passage, if you don't mind, and uh, tech team, thank you for putting that up right away. So three little things. When I said in my title, how does Jesus see me, in that passage, there are three different titles that Jesus has for us. Number one is harvesters. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Jesus is looking for harvesters. Anyone ever work on a farm? My first farm job was at a turnip farm, making $1 an hour. Woohoo! all the turnips you can eat. Yay! <laughs> and my job in the summer was with a hoe, was to go up and down the, the rows and just hoe the, tur the turnips, pull out weeds, all that kind of stuff. In the fall, I got the job to work in the turnip barn. And so all the turnips are harvested, they're put on a conveyor, put through the roof of the barn, fall down, and now the barn is full of turnips. And after school, I would go there and you'd go in a side door, you grab some turnips, wash them, cut the ends off, put wax on them, put it in a box, send them down to the food terminal, and da 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 da. The best part of working at that farm was the harvest. Best part. The hoeing in the summer was not fun. Believe it or not, a dollar an hour did not motivate me. <laughs> but the harvest part was the best. I've worked, uh, when I was younger in high school, we lived in a, in a rural community. My, my dad was a pastor in a rural church. And so we got invited to help do the hay baling. And it's just like, it's a fun time of being able to bring in the harvest. And that's how Jesus sees us with all of the opportunities that are around us. He's, he's given us this amazing part of the harvest is to be able to see people coming into the kingdom. That's the role that he's given us. It's a good role, isn't it? Harvesters, that's, that's one of the names, how Jesus sees you. Number two is he also sees you as a lamb. And the key word there, I'd say, is innocent. And in this passage, it sounds a little scary, but Jesus is sending us like lambs to wolves. Well, that normally is not going to sound good, unless it's a Disney movie. And then the lamb's going to win every single time, correct? <laughs> well, guess what? God's got a movie, and you're the lamb. And it's innocence. It's like we're not expected to know everything. We don't know any of the names of the 72 that were sent out. If I could say it, they weren't good enough to get on the A team. The A team was the 12. And some of them were misfits, weren't they? So if the A team is a few misfits and a few you know, smart Alex and a couple bravado guys and some fishermen and tax collectors and all that different group, if that's the A team, you and I are all on the B team. Woohoo! No expectations. Yay! <laughs> and, yet, and here we are. We're sent out by Jesus just like these ones were. Friends, there was no training that seems to have come along with the job. He just said, go and do the very same thing that I sent the 12 out. And guess what? There was no training for the 12 either. They were just watching Jesus do the stuff. And one day says, you, 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 and you, over here. You're on my team. Okay. Pair up in twos. Go. What do you mean go? Go. Do this, this, and this. 
and they had no training. And they went out like lambs, and they came back, the 72 came back and said, even demons submit to our words and our prayers. That's incredible. Do you know why that's incredible? In the Old Testament, Elijah never kicked out a demon. In the Old Testament, Moses never kicked out a demon. In the Old Testament, no one ever helped someone get free from a demon. And these 72 who had no training, when they got in twos and went out and did it, it happened. And they came back. And the rest of this passage says that when they came back and gave the report, here's an amazing verse for you. It's in the middle of Luke chapter 10. Jesus, it says, full of the Holy Spirit and joy, meaning he's laughing his head off. Laughing his head off, rolling around laughing is what it means. If you are full of joy, it's more than a nice smile. And Jesus is just overwhelmed at how amazing our Father is, that he gives us high-level responsibilities way past our capacity to know what we're doing. And he sees us like lambs, and he knows that there's going to be success. And then the third one, the third one, you know what? Something just, it'd be good if I pressed the right key. I was pressing, I don't know what key I was pressing. Number three, the word travelers isn't here, but basically that's the, that's the key word for this. A little bit like Romas, like gypsies. Don't take a purse or a bag or sandals. Don't greet anyone on the road. Well, the second part sounds like we're not being very nice. But really, this verse is all about you have a role, and I want you to be focused. Don't get distracted by everyone uh, uh, having you over to their house for tea when you're supposed to be going over here. Don't, don't get waylaid, but you're, you have a focused role to do. And he says, you need to understand that if you're called to do this, it's his will and his bill. I love that, that God is able to provide opportunities, not just finances. God is able to provide opportunities. He's able to open doors. God is able to do this. Our role is to start walking. As we start, the Holy Spirit begins to open up all these opportunities for you and I. Like my neighbor yesterday. I don't see him too, too often. Um, he, he, he's, he's not, a, I, I just don't see him too often. He's in the house and he's, not a, he's out of the house and gone and so I, don't, I just don't see him. But for him to come over, uh, we had this little chat when I said you can move your car back and we start talking about raccoons because we share a raccoon problem. Uh, and so he's telling me raccoon stories that he got in the Oakville Beaver newspaper which is our local little newspaper because he phoned the pet control because a raccoon got into a peanut butter jar and a peanut butter jar stuck in his nose and so <laughs> anyways he got in the newspaper for that he phoned he phoned the pest guys but instead of the pest guys showing up the beaver the um, Oakville newspaper showed up so we're telling these kind of stories because and God bless the raccoons they must have known we're talking about him because 10 minutes after he left and I went to my backyard raccoon showed up anyways he initiates the conversations he, he began to, as I said, began to interview me, talk to me about faith, about Christianity. He has mild interest in Judaism, even though he's not Jude, uh, Jewish. And so the fact that I've been to Israel, it's just it's a little, it's a conversation point. And friends, it was easy. He was interviewing me. I was, I've learned to give some loaded questions where I sort of leave it, didn't answer the last part, and he sort of has, he does a follow-up question. I've learned to do that. But it's amazing that when you and I go, the Holy Spirit follows after us, is what Jesus said. So friends, here's some homework for everyone for the month of September. How many of you live in an apartment or a condo? Stand up. Stand up. Apartment or a condo? My alarm that says stop preaching and start praying is on, and we're right on cue. So friends, here is your assignment. When you get home from work, back from groceries, doing anything, as best you can, every day for this month of September, walk down your hall. If possible, put your hand in their door. Make sure they're not looking for the people. <laughs> <laughs> and just speak a blessing and say, may the Holy Spirit visit this house. Yep. If you're seated, put your hand on someone that lives in a condo or an apartment. Father, bless these people. And may they be provoked to just, just draw to their memory when they get off the elevator. Oh, that's right, I'm just going down this hallway and I'm coming right back. Two minutes, three minutes. And just say a quick prayer, blessing, blessing, blessing. 
speaking peace onto your floor. May that happen in Jesus' name. If you live in a house, stand up. Yay, that's more of you. So you folks need to grab someone's hand. Your job is the very same. Guys, do you mind putting me back up on the screen again? So friends, here's, here's everyone's job. House owners, those of you in condos, number one, as you walk in the street, speak peace. Yep, that's our job this month. Get to know your people and the role that Jesus had. We're going to look at this later on, but remember when Ed Savosa was here about two months ago, was teaching us about this, is once you get to know your neighbors, have a meal with them, have coffee with them, have a block party, do something like that. Number three is listen when you're having those conversations. Do not preach the gospel yet. Yet. Listen. Find out what's going on. Find out... Uh, challenges in their home, health problems, financial problems. As you listen, they will start talking because you're on assignment from the Lord. You're a harvester. As you do your part, who comes after you? Jesus does. Uh-huh. So expect that people are going to start opening their mouth and sharing. And then number four, now you get an opportunity to, to go to someone and say, you know, last time I saw you, you were saying that... Um, you and your spouse are really going through some marriage problems. Well, my wife and I, we've been praying every day for you. Anything changed and anything better. And if stuff's happened, if healing has happened, if a job is, has come about, they're going to credit you, and you become their best neighbor ever. When Sandra and I moved, and we went to our... Uh, sorry, we forgot to pray for you guys. Sit down just for a second, house owners, or house people. I'll get you in just a moment. When Sandra and I, in fact, one year ago today was the day that we moved to Oakville. We were 30 years in Mississauga, 15 years at one house, and uh, the neighbors that we shared a driver with, because we have a, a semi-detached house uh, that we had in Mississauga, that's what we have in Oakville as well now. And Glenda, when we went across to tell Glenda that we were selling our house, she cried. The reason she cried is she said that we have been her best neighbors ever, and they've lived in that house 60 years. Best neighbors ever. Why were we the best neighbors? We're good looking. No. <laughs> I don't think that had anything to do with it. We just cared for them. We loved them. We prayed for them. When her husband was in a car accident, was in the hospital visiting, uh, shoveled their driveway in the, in the wintertime, did all that kind of stuff. And friends, that's what we're looking for is that your neighbor rec recognizes that you have something in the kingdom of God to be able to offer to them. Amen? If you live in a house, now stand up. Alrighty. Those of you who live in a condo or an apartment, you need to run around and like get out of your chair and just go and lay hands on like 10 people. Quickly, move, move. Those of you in condos, just move around. Holy Spirit, we're blessing people who live in a house, whether you own it or rent it. Holy Spirit, we're welcoming you to give us opportunities. And friends, your assignment this, this month, as best you can, is to walk your street every morning, take your dog, take your grandkids like Sandra and I do, and just walk your street. For Sandra and I, it's, it's 14. Ed Savosa was suggesting pray for the five houses on your left and on your right and the 10 across the street from you. That's it. Don't try to pray for all of Young Street. <laughs> just five houses on either side and ten across the street and Father we're asking that amazing opportunities would come to us this month in the month of September Father may we be the hands of Jesus may we be the mouth of Jesus and friends that, that are standing we bless you to be harvesters we bless you to be lambs and we bless you to be those who travel taking Jesus everywhere you go and Father, we're holding you to your promise in this scripture that as we go ahead of you, you will come behind and you'll be begin to touch the hearts of people that need to know you. We bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone stand up with me. Sandra, come on up, if you don't mind. In just a moment when we dismiss, just want to remind you, we're having the overflow um, at the back there is to sign up for the connect groups. You'll be able to do that next week as well. And a little brochure that you got in your, in your um, bulletin this morning, if you got a bulletin, sorry that we ran out, 
but all the groups are listed there. As Sandra said, on the left-hand side, my left, as you go back, are the first of all of the young adult groups, and then at the far side on the, my left is the men's groups. On the back wall is all the ladies' groups, and on this wall over here is all the co-ed groups. So if you're looking to be in a group with a partner, a spouse, that's where you go, men only, ladies only, et cetera. Grab someone's hand. I'm just going to welcome the Holy Spirit. Uh, ben, are you still here, Ben, youth? Uh, can I get a couple of the kids who are sharing testimonies that had encounters to come on up and help pray? Just grab a couple, bring them on up. Yes, sorry, John, do you want to just stand up here real quick? Where's Rob McIntosh? Come on up here, Rob, real quick. Sorry, just before we, uh, while well, the youth are coming up to pray, John and Rob are going to be starting a group that's going to be four weeks only. Three weeks, Steve. Three weeks, okay. Just tell me yep, about it. So it's this Saturday, or this, the next three Thursday nights, we're going to talk about what it takes to lead, a, to lead a connect group. For those people that feel like you want to learn what it is, you want to get launched into it, if you've taken School Champions 1, uh, come and be a part of it. We've got School Champions 1 and 2 coming up next weekend, which has already been announced. But come and see us Thursday night. It's going to be in the patio room. Thursday night. What time? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Perfect. So we're, what we're looking to do, we recognize that the groups that we have back there are not enough. We need another 30 groups. And so we're hoping to start a nine-week semester. The groups that are going to be starting next week are a 13-week course. Uh, but we're also looking to have some nine-week courses or nine-week small groups starting in October. So any of you that have led a group before or you're interested in leading a group, see John or Rob right after the meeting, and that would be yep. great. And also, I don't think it's been announced, but we're going to have a family feast uh, next week out in Centennial Park. So read your bulletins. It's all in there. But come and join us. Get to know the family, especially at this new time of the year. Good. All righty. Who is the guy who had freedom? Over here. Pray, pr pray, fr pray freedom over everybody. Okay, God. I just pray freedom over everybody. <laughs> that, uh, you can say it in your words as well. <laughs> that everyone's just eliminated through all their struggles. And that you just bless them in a way that they never had before. And that you just show them uh, your presence. God. Amen. Very good. Ben, send up a laugher. <laughs> ah, yes, you. Yes, you. You guys sp uh, speak in Spanish or English? Uh, I speak both languages. Okay, just English. English, sure, yeah. Um, People will be full of the Holy Spirit right Full of the Holy Spirit, now. sure. Um, thank you, God, for um, today that you just bless everyone's day and that everyone just be filled with your Holy Spirit and that you just overflow in them, Lord, and that they would, when they leave this place, they wouldn't, like, be dry or it would just stop it, just continue going and going and going. Mm. So just keep your eyes closed just for a second here. Just welcome the Holy Spirit right now. Just feel God visiting you. And friends, it happens one of three ways. Your brain feels it or knows it. Sometimes it's your emotions. You can just, like your, your bodies, you, you just know that something's happening. And the third way is your spirit knows it. You don't know why, but you just know that God's visiting you right now. So Holy Spirit, come. Just take a deep breath, friends. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah. Father, I just so thank you that this morning, Lord, you just came. And Father, even as we, we end the service, Lord, that you, you just come and you continue to fill us, Father. And so, Lord... Let today, one of the words um, that, that came out of the worship this morning was uh, we needed to say yes. You know, that there was a shifting, there was a turning point um, in, in what the Lord has said. And it's, it's not just yes for today, but it's yes for always. And so if that's you, just put your hand on your heart. If you, Lord, today we are choosing to say yes. We're saying yes to you for what you want to do how you want to transition and change us, Father, in this, this next season, Lord. Father, thank you for a beautiful summer. And Lord, I thank you that fall will be coming and 
the colors change, Father, and that's your beauty. And so, Father, we just say yes, and we open our hearts to you. And Father, we welcome you in our homes. We welcome you in our neighborhoods, and we thank you, Lord. So friends, before we go, I've invited uh, our youth that went to camp. So any of the youth that are still here, you went to camp, come on up to the front. And friends, if you'd, if you'd like prayer this morning, before you leave, come on up and have one of these on fire, fully clean, fully uh, invigorated, fully vibrating, all those different kind of things. So all the youth that went to camp that are here this morning, come on up to the front. If you'd like someone to pray for you, come on up and do that. Come on up and do that.